What's good? YouTube, Facebook, this is Drill Big Cool Fletcher from Colossal Sports TV in association with 3kingsboxing.com. And today we have a very special guest. You know, a lot of people know him from being the host of Showtime's Championship Boxing. However, he has many different hats as he's also a play-by-play announcer for NFL, NCAA, and football, NCAA football and basketball games, as well as Ice Cube's Big Three League. We have um, also the host of The Last Stand with Brian Custer. Brian Custer himself. How you doing today, sir? Man, feeling great. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Hey, hey, thank you for being patient. Like um, my man Bo said, a lot of technical difficulties, but we're going to get right into it because I know you're a busy man. You told me when um, we were setting this interview up that you wanted to talk specifically about one of the hottest names and best fighters in boxing, that is Errol Spence Jr., the unified welterweight champion, who you have an interview coming out with next Tuesday. Yeah. Um, could you elaborate a little bit, not revealing too much, of what you took away from that interview and how do you think his psyche is, you know, with everything he's been through since that uh, horrific car accident last October? Well, I think probably the word to describe Errol is hungry. Um you know, yeah, we we I have a podcast. It's the Last Stand podcast. Um, you know, you can see it on YouTube. So I want everybody to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, they can hear it on Apple and uh, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify. Um, but, you know, Arrow, that episode will drop on Tuesday. Uh, Arrow was our guest. And, you know, he, he, he was very... Um, uh, he talked a lot about how hungry he is. He said that, you know, he's he's looked at social media. He knows what people have been saying about him. Doesn't think that he's going to be the same when he comes back. He's adamant that he will fight this year. Uh, he said this fall. Uh, and as when you go and watch or listen to the interview, you also hear him say that uh, he doesn't want a tune-up fight. He told Al Heyman that, uh, uh, and as he says in the interview, that he's a shark. And he says that when you're a shark, you don't put a shark in a pool. You put him in his natural habitat. And he wants nothing but big fights. And, you know, he tells us that there are th- only three fights that he wants at 147 before he moves up. And uh, his his next fight is one of those big ones. And he says it will occur this fall. All right, Stephen, we know it's kind of been revealed by now that that opponent is looking like – Two division world champion um, Danny Swift Garcia. What are your thoughts on that potential matchup? Do you think personally that it's too soon for him to come back straight into a fight against a guy of that experience and caliber? No, you know, uh, listen, I, you know, that's one of the things we talk about because, you know, I, I, I tried to really press him on, you know, it wouldn't it be better um, to, you know, take a tune up fight to kind of ease your way back. But, you know, he, he maintains that, you know, he has been feeling great ever since he said about January, February is when he knew he had no more pain uh, from the accident. He said that uh, at the time when we interviewed him, he said his weight was about 155. So he said he was right there uh, uh, at his training weight and that, you know, he is ready. Uh, he feels that his reflexes are good. He said he'll start sparring, which I thought was really interesting. He, you know, you'll hear him talk about in the uh, interview that he's going to – he hasn't sparred yet, but he will start sparring in July, he said. Um, but, you know, he, he, in his estimation, there's no need, he said, for a tune-up fight. And that if you're the unified champ, you want to defend your belts and you want to defend your belts against the best. And he thinks that Danny Garcia is a, a good competitor – um, and he thinks it would just do nothing but enhance his resume. And so he looks forward to that opportunity. Well, it sounds like, like you said, he's hungry, motivated, and determined to prove the nation wrong. Um, by chance, was Terrence Crawford one of those three names he mentioned to you? Yeah, he was. Uh, he, he said three fights. He said three fights at 147. Uh, the last one he said would be Terrence Crawford. And, he, and you will hear in the interview he talks about that. He tells us when he, he anticipates that fight happening. Uh, he does says it will happen. Um, but he he said he will not leave. And he, he says this specifically during our interview. He will not leave 147, that division, until he's fought Terrence Crawford. 
and that is music to you know not only fight fans but boxing pundits ears. Speaking of Terrence Bud Crawford, what are your thoughts personally uh, on him as a fighter, and how do you see that potential matchup? you know, playing out considering that he's the naturally smaller guy, but some may say that he's the more versatile um, fighter. I love it. Uh, yeah, I love it. I think I think it's what everybody wants to see. You know, the the irony is just last week I interviewed Terrence Crawford. Uh, it was the first time I'd had the opportunity to talk with him. He's going to be a guest on the Last Stand podcast as well. So the Terrence Crawford interview, we're going to drop that one in a couple of weeks uh, that one is being edited right now, uh, but it was my opportunity, first opportunity uh, to speak with him. We had n- never met, uh, but he was, you know, as I'm a fan of his talent, he said he was a fan of my work, so that's why he wanted to come on the podcast and do it. Um, but, you know, he talked about the matchup, and he also said that it was a fight that he can't wait. They both said this in the interview that you will hear that they've had a phone conversation about it. Um, they talked uh, in depth about making the fight happen. Um, and, you know, Terrence Crawford, and I asked both of these guys, how do you envision that fight going? And, you know, he, he even Errol said he doesn't see that fight as a boxing match at all. Uh, that these are two guys that, as he, he puts out, he said these are two dogs. And that, you know, you can say that, hey, we're going to feel each other out. But then once someone lands leather, you just go back to your natural instinct, and that's the throw. And he said he he basically sees that as an all action fight. Terrence Crawford told me he he's played the fight over in his mind, and he sees himself winning it. And you know, I thought the real interesting thing that you'll hear Terrence Crawford say in the interview is he doesn't want any excuses. You know, when he in his mind he says when he wins this fight, uh, he doesn't want anyone saying well if. Errol Spence hadn't gone through that car accident, you know, maybe it would have been a different fight. Errol Spence said the quite opposite. I feel great. I think it's going to be a great fight. He sees himself winning it and uh, there will be no excuses. So it's, it's really, it was really great to talk to both of these guys. They both had a uh, kind of a different point of view, obviously on who was going to win the fight, but they also had a different point of view on how the fight was going to be played out in their minds uh, so I think that's probably one thing that people will enjoy hearing Errol Spence seeing how he sees the fight, how it would play out, and hearing Terrence Crawford see how uh, how he thinks the fight will play out in their mind. Definitely can't wait. Now for you talking to both of them, do you actually? Because we hear a lot of these guys. And I use the example, you know, Mayweather Pacquiao for years both stated how they wanted to fight each other. Of course, it was under some relegate, you know, regulations about drug testing, but. From interviewing both of these guys, you know, do you think personally that it actually will get done and it won't be any more smoke and mirrors or that they just telling, you know, media and fans what they want to hear just to kind of get them off the back about asking that question, even though they know it won't be stopped. It won't stop being asked until they fight. Yeah, I think um, I, I think it, it is definitely a fight that will happen. Um, and I think they both kind of agreed as you'll hear in the interview, that it will occur in 2021. Um, and, and they both said this. Listen, there, there is no boundaries. We, we, can, we can make the fight happen, they said, either with uh, Showtime and ESPN or ESPN and Fox. And so they both, I thought, which I thought was really interesting, is that Errol said he's already had discussions with Al Heyman about it. Bob Arum has already had, you know, discussions he said, Terrence said with him, and that both guys have already said, hey, look, get the fight done. So there's there's already, uh, they have already put in their request with their respective teams on getting the, the fight done. I think both of them um, have what they say some unfinished business, though, in their division. I know Errol, his point was when he fights Terrence Crawford, He wants to be the undisputed welterweight champion of the world. So what does that mean? That means that you got to get that other belt, that WBA belt. So that's why he wants Manny Pacquiao as well. Uh, Terrence Crawford said the same thing. When I fight Errol, I want to be the undisputed welterweight champion of the world. So what does that mean? That means if you're Terrence Crawford, you need that Manny Pacquiao belt, which is 
a fight that both of those guys want before they fight each other because they say when they face each other, they want it to be for the undisputed welterweight championship of the world. And, and that's what it should be. You know, if it comes down to those two guys or whoever it may be, you know, we always want to see the best, fight the best. And obviously, if you're fortunate enough, you know, and good enough to win, you know, we will see that. Um, shifting gears a little bit, you spoke, you spoke of Showtime, which, you know, you, you know, you're the host of Showtime Championship Boxing. How have you been kind of preparing yourself to get back into the mode of hosting fights, knowing that it won't be the fans there? They kind of give it that extra emotion and, and revs up the atmosphere along with the fighters, you know, making the competitive fight. Have you been going over how you're going to attack it or are you just going as business as usual? No, well, you know, listen, it, it is, uh, I think when it comes to our job, it's like an athlete. You get better with reps and, um, you know, it will be different. Uh, I know that uh, Showtime, we've had uh, discussions already and that we anticipate coming back in July, uh, coming back in early to mid-July. And according, you know, to our boss, he wants to come back and he wants nothing but high-level fights uh, coming back. And I think one of the things that uh, Errol and Terrence said that what you will see, because I thought maybe when we can't, when the guys come back, Will we see a drop in talent or will guys be rusty? And they said they think it will be the opposite because they said guys will be hungry, that, you know, they haven't had a payday in a long time and guys are going to really get after it. It ain't going to be no more feeling out. It's going to be like guys getting right back in the ring and getting after each other. Um, so, yeah, I know at Showtime, we've talked a lot about having big time fights right out of the gate and um, having really good cards, getting back to what, we had uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago, you know, when we, it was every year, Showtime was just the, the main event, the co-main event, even the opening bout were, were un unbelievable fights. And I think that's what we, we are looking at doing. And then for us, I mean, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. We talked a lot about even us being tested whenever, we, whether it's we do it in Vegas, whether we do it in California, as soon as we arrive, being tested. Um, you know, basically being uh, locked into our hotel rooms until fight night and uh, and then fight night going out there. And, and yeah, it'll be a really an empty venue, whether it be a sound stage, uh, whether it be a, a hotel ballroom. Um, but that that was going to it's going to be really interesting to not have a crowd or a very small crowd and have the same energy. But, you know, it's just like a fighter. You're there, you're getting paid to do a job, you're, doing, you're getting paid to do it to the best of your ability, whether or not the venue's filled or whether or not there's nobody there. Uh, I know I'm going to bring my A game, and I can't wait to do it. Exactly, yeah. I, and I, that's what I wonder for the fighters. Cause I know, like I said, because they're normally, you know, you have that energy, your team, and everybody support you when the tough get going. But now it, it really is going to show who's mentally stronger, even more so just because you don't have all that extra – you know, motivation and family and fans cheering you on. So you're going to have to, you know, dig deep within yourself when it's just you, the fighter, and the referee, and fight back and overcome their adversity. So it's definitely going to be interesting, to say the least, to see not only how they react when they fight, but are they coming out of this quarantine, you know, in shape, mentally and physically prepared to go right into these big fights that they say they want. So I'm looking forward to that like you and so many other people are. And, you know, I, th I thought one of the things that I thought was really interesting and that Bud Crawford brought this up because I talked to in Errol the same way. I asked them about fighting in front of uh, no crowds. And, you know, one of the one of the things that a lot of network, whether it's Showtime, whether it's um, ESPN, whether it is Fox, they've said to these guys, listen, if we don't have a crowd, uh, the, the paycheck is not going to be as big as it was before. I thought the economics of boxing had gotten out of whack anyway, especially with DAZN coming into the mix and, and even Fox and throwing an exorbitant amount of money at some of these fighters for, you know, fights and putting some fights on as pay-per-view fights when really they should have just been regular fights or championship type level fights. And, um, you know, going now that going forward, those paychecks aren't going to be big because you won't have a gate. And, you know, Bud Crawford said, listen, it will be about a year. I, if I have to, uh, I'll sit out a year 
but I'll I'll wait until we are allowed to have fans if they're going to cut my my paycheck down. You know, he he felt like he has spent years taking less money to build up his brand and build up where he is. So why should he be penalized now? He felt like if he has to sit out a year, he'll sit out a year, but he's going to be paid his worth when he steps back into the ring, even if that means not fighting this year. Errol was different. You know, he wants to fight this year. So, you know, he he heard, he heard he's heard a lot of chatter. Uh, he wants to really show people that he's back, he's healthy, and he's the unified champ. So uh, he, he had a different approach to it. Um, but I, I still think it, it may be a little bit different for him because even if it is Danny Garcia, uh, that is his fight when he comes back, it will still be a pay-per-view fight. So he's still going to make good money. Yeah, I wonder. I want to know if they probably gonna, um, you know, tweak the, you know, the prices because with this whole pandemic, people being yeah. laid off, of fire, I can't imagine them saying, you know, paying sixty, seventy, eighty dollars for a pay per view, no matter who it is, just because you got to be considerate of the fans that really plays a big part in get, getting these fighters and these events to the record breaking numbers that they get to. No question. Uh, and you know, listen, I think. Uh, a number of the networks have been discussing that. I know Showtime uh, has been talking about that. They've even been talking about whether or not to even do pay-per-view this year. And if they do do it only uh, when they've gotten the all clear and contain and that you can have fights, because really that's the only way you're going to be uh, have, have a crowd, because really that's the only way that you can make money off this. If you're not going to have the gate, and you're going to put on a pay-per-view fight, boy, uh, you're really uh, going to lose a lot of money, especially if you don't come down on the price. So uh, it, it will be interesting. I know that a number of networks have been talking about just that. Um, and I know that there have been a lot of fights who are kind of waiting. I know just from Showtime's uh, standpoint, you know, you've got Leo Santa Cruz and Tank Davis who want to fight each other, will fight each other, but they want it to be a pay-per-view fight. And if that's the case, they are willing, from my understanding, to wait until you are allowed to have fans in the arena to do that fight, even if that means pushing it back to January or waiting until November, December. Wow, that's a, that that that's kind of, you don't want to hear that from, you know, the top fighters just because you want to see them. You know, but I mean, these fighters is their prerogative. They're right. Going to their line, line, and they got to do what they got to do to, you know, take care of their family. So, you know, I guess we just got to, you know, wait and see how that that goes. But I imagine by 2021, hopefully, we'll be able to have fans um, in attendance because I don't, I just don't see it this year. You know, it's just too too risky to even do do such a thing. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And and a lot of it depends on the people. I mean, you want you want a vaccine. Um, and you want you want the confidence of the public that they feel safe in a 15,000, 12,000 seat venue because you're going to be sitting right next and right up under somebody. And a, how do you get those people out? Uh, how what's your exit plan, the entrance plan? So you're absolutely right. You know, you got you got to have uh, the public confidence uh, before you you make that move and, and open your venue up to crowds. Yeah, that's true. And I got a few more questions if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Deontay Wilder. You yeah. know, we all, we all see what we all saw what happened in February. He was dominated, one sided fight, dropped twice, and ultimately knocked out or his corner stopped the fight. What were your thoughts leading up to the rematch? Or might have been, let's take it back a little bit. They fought December 2018. What were your thoughts during and after the fight once the uh, official announcement, you know, decision was announced? Did you agree with it? Or did you see uh, Wilder really losing that fight? And then I'll ask you about the rematch. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was one of those fights where I came out of it like, you know what? Hey, I could see a draw. I mean, I thought Fury did a lot of good things in that first fight. But, you know, Deontay dropped him twice. Obviously, that last knockdown... Um, had a big impact on the judges. Um, you know, hey, listen, there are a number of people who say, you know, if you're the champ, you got to knock him out. 
Um, so I, I, I couldn't really argue too much about the draw. I thought, I thought, you know, Deontay, he looked like a guy who was on his first pay-per-view fight. You, you could tell that he pressed and wanted to really go for the knockout early uh, to make a statement because he was on pay-per-view for the first time and he wanted to, it was almost like he wanted to show people I deserve to be on pay-per-view and he pressed too much and got out of what made him uh, the devastating heavyweight that he was. So that was my thoughts of the first one. The second one, I was just as surprised as everyone else. I really thought that uh, Wilder would take the lessons that he learned from that first fight and say, okay, I'm going to use my tools, my jab, and really control this fight and set up my shot, kind of like what he did against Luis Ortiz in the second fight. And I and when I heard that Fury had put on the extra weight uh, and was going to come forward, I was like, oh my goodness, that's a recipe for disaster. But I, I'll give you what I, I'll tell you what you know. Tyson Fury is one of the most skilled boxers in the game. I mean, let alone heavyweight. To be that big and to move and, you know, give him his props. He put on the extra weight and he became the bully. And he did something that uh, he found that other guys couldn't do. And that was to make Deontay fight going backwards, which was not shown to be uh, Deontay's forte. And I thought Tyson Fury clearly dominated that, that second fight. Um, I think, you know, a lot of folks were turned off when, you know, Wilder had his excuse for why he, he lost that fight. You know, I know he had the surgery with his arm, but when he talked about the, the outfit, you know, I'm sure his team too, uh, didn't like that too much because, you know, if you're trying to sell yourself on a third fight, the last thing you want to do is make excuses, um, on, on why you lost. Um, so I think that's probably why he hasn't really talked too much to the media. But, you know, listen, he is a proud and he's a champion for a reason. You know, he's going to train hard. Uh, I think the third fight, if they they get in the ring together, uh, will be just as explosive as the first two have. I mean, listen, they're two of the best heavyweights in the world. And I think the third fight will be just as exciting as the first two. Yeah, like I said, I, I feel like he was tense. If you see the lead up, um, actually on fight night, you know Wilder was pacing back and forth. He was he was in the zone, you know what I'm saying. And if you could have thought, you know, before they got in the ring, that that was just him zoning out. But when you come to think about it, you know what I'm saying, he kind of looked too tense. Like he still couldn't believe he was on pay per view again. To your words about the first fight, and Fury looked loose and calm and and knew that confident. Go in there. Yes. Very, very confident. I, and, I, you, you know, say what you want about Tyson Fury. You know, hey, he's a showman. But boy, he can back it up with his skills. And, hey, listen, this, this, is, this is where you find out uh, what you're all about, not only as an athlete, as a person, as a man, when your back is against the wall and everyone's doubting you. Whereas everyone was talking a lot about Deontay Wilder, a lot about his power, and maybe, hey, look, Maybe he he even started to believe the hype where he, you know, he had said it a million times. A lot of guys, they've got to be perfect for 36 minutes. I only have to be perfect for two seconds, and that's for me to land my right hand. And maybe he he started to believe that hype and found out, you know what, that's not true. I do have to use this, all the skills that I have. I am a former Olympian. I was a champion for a reason, and I've shown in the past that I can dominate people with my jab and set up this right hand. You know what? Let me get back to the basics and show people why I was the WBC heavyweight champion of the world, and I think this is what we'll find out when they fight again. I, I look forward to the rematch and seeing what improvements that he made, if any, because he's going to have to you know, make – some substantial ones if he wants to get, you know, get back against Fury because Fury already has the right mind treatment if he didn't get it already. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be interesting. Um, and, last and, and, the, and the biggest thing that, that Tyson Fury has now is confidence. Confidence. Because in his mind, he felt like, I won the first fight. And now... I won the second one even more decisively, and you and you've already heard him say, "Well, we fight again. It won't be uh, six rounds or seven rounds like the second one. It's going to be even earlier." So the the one he's got confidence now, and so if you're Deontay Wilder, 
you better go in there and shake that confidence because Fury's walking into the ring a very confident fighter. Yes, he is. And last thing, where can we, uh, where can the fans um, check out your interviews? I want you to plug your podcast so you know they can check out the interviews not only with Errol Spence, Terrence Crawford, but your other ones outside of boxing. So let them know where they can reach you at. Also, absolutely. I Me, mean, the Last Stand podcast. Um, you know, listen, we we like to say we interview. Uh, the biggest names in sports and entertainment. Uh, we've already had Donovan McNabb on. We've had Ice Cube, uh, Dusty Baker, the new manager of the Astros. We're doing Errol Spence next week. We've got Jay Wright, the head coach of Villanova. Uh, we've got Bud Crawford. We even got the comedian Michael Blackson that's going to be dropping in a couple of weeks, which all I'm going to say is make sure uh, you, you got a funny bone and that the kids aren't in the room when you listen to the Michael Blackson uh, interview because you will die laughing. But go to YouTube right now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's the Last Stand Podcast with Brian Custer. Go to YouTube right now. We want thousands of th- upon thousands of people to subscribe to it. All you got to do is go to YouTube, hit subscribe, boom, and you'll make sure you'll get the episodes as soon as they drop. Uh, Arrows drops on Tuesday. You can listen to us. On Google Podcasts, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts. Um, you can also go to Spotify. And more importantly, you can go to our website. And our website is laststandsports.com. And it shows you all the episodes. You can support the show if you want. And you can email us and let us know, hey, I'd love for you to interview this person. We always want to hear from uh, everybody who supports the show. Tell us who you want us to interview Uh, And we will go after them. That's what we want to do. We want to entertain people, bring them good content. If you want support the show as well, you can do that. You know, whether it's a dollar, 50 cents, two dollars, whatever it is, uh, you can do all that at the website, laststandsports.com. But really want everybody to go to YouTube and please, please subscribe. There it is. Brian Custer, support him, one of the hardest working men in not only boxing, but sports in general. We here at 3kingsboxing.com definitely will be supporting you. Um, and like I said, maybe down the line we can do this again. Yeah. Uh, without the uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Um, so everybody that's watching, make sure you subscribe to the Last Stand podcast with Brian Custer. Also subscribe to 3kingsboxing.com YouTube channel, like the Facebook page, and check out the website for your daily breaking news, unfiltered, unbiased boxing news brought to you by us. Until next time, we're all out. Have a good evening.